the statue of Jesus in India recently began to drip water from the toes of the statue. Local Christians thought they were witnessing a miracle and began to collect and drink the miraculous water, hoping for a blessing. However, tests run on the water and an ensuing investigation from a plumber led to the discovery that the water was leaking through the back of the statue from a leaky toilet, which would hardly deserve mention here today were it not for the clear way that it symbolizes everything that I have come to absolutely hate about traditional religion. The Jesus who was an advocate for the outcast and the poor, the sick, the hungry, the spat upon and rejected, the Jesus who stood up to the might of the Roman occupation army to teach a message of radical compassion and paid for it with his life, in the hands of the church has become nothing but a magical get-out-of-the-grave-free amulet, reducing the poor, the ignorant, the sick, the marginalized to theologically drinking toilet water and being told it's a blessing. I'm trying. (laughs) I find it somewhat ironic that the Catholic Church, under its first South American-born pope, is working now to beatify Oscar Romero, calling him a saint in 2020, when the institutional church that produced Pope Francis may have been complicit in the murder of Oscar Romero in El Salvador in 1980. When Pope Francis was a bishop in Argentina, he said little or nothing to protect the liberation theology priests of Latin America and may in fact have turned over the names of certain liberation priests to the authorities who then captured, tortured, and murdered them. If you do not know Oscar Romero's story, I highly recommend the movie Romero to you. For those of you here in Springfield, I have a copy of the movie and will gladly lend it to you. Romero was chosen to be the Archbishop in El Salvador as a safe choice. He was a theological scholar and a loyal Catholic priest who was expected to moderate the tensions between the military, the ruling class, and the poor who lived in El Salvador. But I'll tell you this about the progressive movement, about what it means to fall headlong into liberation theology. It's like pulling a thread on a knit sweater. There's just no good place to stop until the whole thing is unraveled. When you are in the institution, when you've been taught to drink the holy water from the toilet with devotion, once you get to look behind the statue and see where the water is coming from, your feelings about the institution can never be the same. Please indulge me a moment to share with you a parable from Hindu Vedantic philosophy. It's said that a man was walking in the gathering darkness of late evening when he felt something brush against his leg He looked down and saw a poisonous snake coiled by the path, and immediately he could feel the venom burning through his veins. He fell to the ground, crying out for help. A man with a lamp rushed up, and it revealed in the light of the lamp that it was not a coiled snake, it was a coiled up rope. Once the man who had been bitten and was dying saw the rope, when the truth dawned on him, He no longer felt the burning poison, and his fear and dread left him. Once you have clearly seen the rope, no one can ever again convince you that it's a snake. Being archbishop brought the cries of the liberation theology priests who were being beaten, imprisoned, and tortured to Oscar Romero's ears. He then got out among the people and his eyes were opened to the cruelty of the government oppression of the poor in ways that he could have never learned in a classroom or inside the sanctuary of a cathedral. I studied liberation theology at, at Harvard, and I, and I got to tell you, that was an enchanted time. I loved my time at Harvard. It was beautiful and wonderful being in that place. 
But I'll tell you, I learned about liberation theology when I helped Javier to build a home for his family and his beautiful children. And we built it out of bamboo we cut out of the jungle and mud. And to realize that his kids have to grow up in that environment. So when Oscar Romero had his awakening, when he saw what was really going on, and he says, a church that does not provoke a crisis, a church that preaches a gospel that doesn't unsettle people or proclaim a word of God that doesn't get under anyone's skin, that doesn't touch the real sin of the society in which it's being proclaimed. What kind of gospel is that? What good is that? Romero had discovered that there was a snake in El Salvador and the church had spent a hundred years telling people it was a rope. Romero became a courageous advocate for the poor and he was a saint to the poor of El Salvador long before the Vatican found a conscience. And so on March 24th, 1980, the government of El Salvador sent an assassin who had been trained by the United States military at Fort Benning, Georgia, to kill Archbishop Romero while he was saying mass in a small convent. All indications are that this was done with the tacit approval of the communist-fearing Pope John Paul II, who had Romero's grave hidden so that no one would make a martyr out of him. The martyr, Pope Francis, has now made a saint in much the same way that the American government after spying on, beating, and harassing Martin Luther King Jr. until he was assassinated, a few years later made him a virtual American saint by naming a federal holiday after him. A few years ago, I was asked to leave a, a local NAACP meeting when I pitched a fit, hard to imagine, but they were proposing that that year we celebrate Martin Luther King's holiday by recruiting young people to pick up trash along the side of the road. I simply asked, do you think James Earl Ray shot Martin Luther King because he was advocating for picking up litter? The church, the state, the schools tend to tame our prophets. They pull the teeth of tigers. We name streets in dangerous neighborhoods after them. We make them a saint for the poor to pray to only after we have murdered them and hidden their grave for 20 years. Amen. A little over a year ago, Dan Goodwin and Paul Tomlinson and I spent way too much money on an old guy's nostalgia trip, and we went to hear Elton John in concert in St. Louis. It was an amazing show. The aging rock star did not let time cause him to pull any punches as he pounded on his piano and sang for two hours. On the way home the next morning, the lyrics of Burn Down the Mission just kept echoing in my head. Burn down the mission if you want to stay alive. For things are getting desperate in our home, living in the parish of the restless folks I know. Behind four walls of stone, the rich man sleeps. It's time we put the flame torch to the keep. Now, most days I would hear that figuratively, but I got to tell you, there are days lately when it seems like it just ought to be literally done. There are times that I think if there really were a supernatural theistic deity who lived in the clouds, that one day we would wake up and there would be nothing but a black, smoldering, greasy spot on the ground where most churches used to be. Sometimes it seems like the church is a prison, a prison for the mind that has to be burned down for people to be free to be able to experience the truth, not just about God, but about themselves. Now I have to pull back the curtain a little bit and honestly tell you, I sketched this sermon out a couple of months ago so that my first message of a new decade would be to hit the traditional churches in the face with an accusation of hypocrisy for basically giving people toilet water to drink when they're living in a world that's being turned into a cesspool through environmental degradation and that is being taught to live with lies and corruption from our government and to acquiesce to the violence of poverty, racism, and sexism that we now face. But as much as I want to be a spiritual philosopher more than a commentator on current events, 
Folks, you know I would be a hypocrite if I came in here today and talked about ethics as a general topic and ignored the fact that on Thursday night, what was Friday morning in Iraq, our government committed what all nations have agreed to be illegal and unethical, a state-sponsored political assassination. The media and President Trump want for us to believe unquestioningly, unquestioningly that Iranian General Qasem Soleimani was a bad guy, maybe even a terrorist. But you all know that he was no Osama bin Laden. He was a member of a government who evidently was uniquely good at his assigned military task. I'm not even going to pretend to put him on trial. I'd never heard of him before he was killed Thursday night. We might have, uh, he might have been an especially bad actor from the perspective of the USA, Israel, and the Saudis, but I know he was a hero to the Sunnis who live in Iran and Iraq. And really, why should we believe what our government tells us about him when our government lies to us much more often than they tell the truth? We've just reached a point where it's very hard to believe anything that they say under any circumstances. Now, I don't want to go all legalistic on you this morning, but in 1981, Ronald Reagan signed Executive Order 12333, stating that no person employed by or acting on behalf of the United States government shall engage in or conspire to engage in assassination. He said that pointing a finger right in the face of the CIA that had been trying to poison Fidel Castro for 30 years. As a part of the civilized world, we may kill people on a battlefield, but we don't assassinate political leaders. Once you start doing that, then no government's uh, elected officials can be safe anywhere. I hope I'm not alone among the hundreds of thousands of preachers standing in pulpits this morning for decrying this criminal act that was carried out on our behalf with our taxpayer dollars. But beyond such fine points of law and international relations, without judging whether General Solanami was such a threat to world peace and stability that he needed killing, let's allow ourselves a moment to ask ourselves, why have we been at war in the Middle East constantly for 20 years and off and on for 80 years? Why? I'm going to boil it down to a pretty simplistic explanation. I believe that we can trace our military involvement in oil-rich Middle East to the invention of the automobile. Coal-powered passenger trains and electrically-powered trolleys and subways began to be elbowed out by gas-powered cars that took their place. The American economy soon began to revolve around the manufacture of automobiles and then the construction of roads and bridges and parking lots and parking structures and covering our entire landscape in almost every city intersection with gas stations and mechanic shops. Our Western civilization became automobile driven and it was fueled with oil largely from the Middle East. We now burn about 150 billion gallons of gas every year, which affects the marketplace and our home budget whenever the price of gas goes up or down. But we are sending hundreds of billions of dollars every year to oil producing countries that we can hardly stand the thought of even a temporary interruption in the flow of oil. America actually benefits from the regional disputes among oil producing nations because their need to buy military hardware incentivizes them to keep producing more oil and to sell it cheaper so that they can buy military hardware from us. That's why when Iran and Iraq were at war with each other for a decade, we watched with a certain fiscal satisfaction and actually helped both sides to keep the war going. But it leaves us persistently involved in ways that are bad for us and is bad for them. Now there are two major divisions in the Islamic world, the Sunnis and the Shia, and if I took the names of countries off this map, 
Most Americans could not have told you where Syria is, nor would they know that it borders Iraq and Israel and Jordan. And if this map were not color-coded, would you know that both Iran and Iraq are majority Shia and that Saudi Arabia is mostly Sunni and Yemen is mostly Shia? You probably wouldn't have known that, but there are tremendous tensions between these divisions. And there are others. There's the Kurds involved in that, and there's a wasabi form of Sunni. But, but basically, you've got tremendous religious tribalism that divides these countries from each other. Now, I don't want to say that all the conflicts in the Middle East are based on religious differences or could be uh, explained by tribal rivalries, but it is not an exaggeration now to say that our country has invested over the last 20 years $4 trillion on what amounts to civil wars in which we have done nothing but make matters worse. Saddam Hussein was a bad man. He was an evil ruler. Hussein kept his Sunni Ba'athist government in power because the Sunnis were the, in the minority. He was governing a Shia nation, and he did that by murdering almost a quarter of a million people during the 24 years that he was in power. So we came in as liberators, right? But in less than 20 years, we've killed over 300,000 people, more than Hussein did. So who's the bad guy? Who's messing up? At least when Hussein was there, they had electricity 24 hours a day. We cannot find a military solution to civil wars. And every time we get involved, we raise the stakes, we burn up resources, we destroy their economy, their housing, their hospitals, and their education system. But what could we do? If everything we've done is wrong, what could we do that would be right? And it's not going to surprise any of you to find out, I have a plan. <laughs> if America went on a wartime footing of building the infrastructure necessary to generate electricity from wind and solar sources, and we started commuting in electric cars, trains, buses, trolleys, and subways, then we could stop sending $300 billion a year to this war-torn region, and they then could not even afford to buy all of the military hardware that maintains their civil strife. And that same solution could at the same time save our planet and bring an end to most global conflict while stabilizing the global economic flow of money. And there's an added bonus. We wouldn't have to send one of our drones to assassinate somebody who was keeping us from having access to sunshine and wind. Now, you ought to expect religious people, like me, to be opposed to war, right? Religious people ought to be opposed to assassination and murder. And yet, when a preacher gets too far out on a limb on these things, that preacher is likely to either get fired or, like Martin Luther King or Oscar Romero, they may well be killed. And so, for the most part, the church is silent on matters of war, political assassination, or even our lethal addiction to oil that keeps us from focusing on renewable energy. And if the church can remain silent when the stakes are this high, then let me retur uh, return to my previous point. What use is that church? What good is that gospel? If that's all it's going to do, then we need to burn them down if we're going to stay alive. Burn them down so that a new and more useful kind of church might rise up out of the ashes to boldly tell the truth in the midst of an empire built on lies. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.